This is the one with Cookie Cutter Kids. Mrs. Angelo's rhubarb surprise. And in which the runaway bride finally gets a husband. And can someone tell Proper Dave who turned out the fucking lights? It's called Forest of the Dead. Here we go! We're still on our endless voyage, all through time and all through space. With Levine and angels now, Dalek, Cyber, Zandu, wow! Ken and Smith and Eccleston, Gallifrey, it all began. Doctor Who is cool again, that was Russell's master plan. Who back when? If you ain't all knew who there is, who back when? Subscribe and rate on iTunes, please. Rose and Donna, Amy Pond, Rory, Martha and beyond. Join us on this odyssey, what other choice could there be than who back when? Who back when? Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode N051 of Who Back When, a Doctor Who podcast. <clears throat> oh, um, or Doc passed. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I am Punkin, and with me in the studio today is Drew. Yes! Hello, me. Drew. Just me. Alas, Marie could not make it today. She's feeling a little bit under the weather. Hope you feel better, Marie, if you're listening. Yeah. Oh, and I've got to give a shout out to Rory. Oh, go for it. You let me have the car so I could drive here. Oh. Hi, Rory. Well done, Rory. That's as involved with the podcast as he is these days. <laughs> <laughs> today we are having a chit-chat about Forest of the Dead, which is, as we pointed out just before pressing record, N051, and thus... Oh, we, we are getting ever so, so close to catching up with the classic reviews. Yes. It's quite exciting. Yeah, I can't wait. I've been trying to engineer this for a year and a half, and also getting close to the end of Tenant. Yes, that's true. The foreboding is increasing every week. Oh, so exciting. It, so this is part two of a double feature, obviously, that was initiated with Silence in the Library. And if you haven't heard our review of that already, then go back and have a listen. Yeah. What could follow that? What could possibly follow Silence in the Library? We loved Silence in the Library. Mm. I mean, we really, really loved it. You gave it like a 4.6. Seven or eight. We were all in that area, yeah. How does this one compare? Is this one better, worse, on par? What is it? What is it? What is it? Oh, how about I tell you after a B scale? Okay, let's do that. Let's jump into a bite sized chunk of who. Time for us to synopsize, lobify and summarize. So take a view and grab a brew and, and listen to this overview. overview. This free for all. We like to call a bite sized chunk of who. Bite-sized chunk of who? Doc, River, and Co. clearly survived last week's cliffhanger. No! But, <laughs> <laughs> but Donna, meanwhile, is stuck in a world of her own. It seems she's in a hospital run by Dr. Moon, who's part psychologist, part matchmaker, in that she's soon set up with an eligible mute. In the library, however, Doc and the Scooby gang of archaeologists are running around in circles while trying to establish contact with both Cal and the Banana Rama. Sunset is upon them, and the shadows are closing in. Zombie astronaut action ensues. B scout over. You are welcome. Oh wow! I was all we, over we, the place. There. Yeah, you were. You were bouncing off the walls. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of the walls, go for it. The cliffhanger. Oh, and its resolution. Ah. Oh. <laughs> Ah, well, it, ah, <laughs> 15 minutes went by. <laughs> yeah, ah, you're, you're right. But that is exactly what you predicted in uh, <sighs> After Part 1, Nespa, right? I was so, you, so mortally disappointed. Are you impressed by my poker face? Uh, <laughs> my past poker face presented to you when you went, I wonder if she's going to use the squareness gun on the wall to just escape. Yeah, and then Marie, Marie was like, oh no, he wouldn't do that. <laughs> it, it'd be better than that. And I was like, yeah, of course it will be. And we, we rested easy and Moffat coming up with an ingenious escape for all of them. And <laughs> Oh, fuck me, mate. Yeah. I mean, last, last week I said that I couldn't predict a single thing in 43 minutes and Moffat surprised me at every turn. Technically that's true. Yeah. But I feel just cheated and lied to. Because and, she uh, used the squareness gun. Yeah. So in my notes, and I, I took down a fair amount of notes for this one, my very first one is a question, namely, why not use the cut and paste gun on proper Dave? What, as in, where would he go? Um, well, just cut him out of it. But then they have to paste him back in? Oh, and he's but they on never, the other side? But I don't think that he... Wait, hang on. Do they use the paste function in this this episode? I don't think that they do. It's still just the cut feature of the cut and paste gun. Oh, but once they're... No, surely once they're back the other side of the wall, they paste the wall back in and proper Dave is on the other side. I suppose that would make more sense. Yeah. Yeah. This was an instant minus 0.5 for me. So really? So however what? good the episode is, from this point on, it cannot be as good as last week's. 
it, this impacted at least the first half. The first half, but I was The fact still... that they just escaped last week's cliffhanger using the, the cotton paste gun. Using the cheapest device imaginable that you could see coming. Yes. Interesting. It, it coloured the, the first half and every... You know, I was just moping. That's interesting. To me, it, I mean, it just doesn't have that effect on me. Yeah, I see how it's a cheap cop-out. But that's fine. You watched them back to back, though. I did, yeah. Whereas uh, I, in I, fact, I rewatched them back to back. Yeah, uh, yeah. Swat. The <laughs> I, I luxuriated in the greatness of the cliffhanger. Yeah. And now I see that it was all just artifice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in that case, I have to ask you. I mean, we're not necessarily following the chronology of this episode. By starting at the beginning. By now jumping into the I middle. I see, I see. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Fine, so they escape cliffhanger number one by using the cut and paste gun. Yeah. Fast forward to the middle, there's just a conveniently placed theatre trap door. <laughs> oh yeah, to nowhere. <laughs> to no- Why is there a trap door there? In, in case there's a <laughs> 5,000 foot tall ladder, which they have specifically to reach that, and they need to clean the underside of the trap door because it gets dusty. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> See, that to me, that subtracts decimal that, points for me. That was another minus 0.3. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, you are harsh in this one. I was going to break that out later on, but uh, yeah, maximum 4.2 from here on in. We'll see how low I go. Holy smokeroonies and cheesecakes. Okay, well, I'm very excited. But, <laughs> but that scene in particular, that took it down a peg for me. There's another episode in um, a classic, sorry, a serial uh, a classic serial called, oh, The Trap? No, The Rescue. Not The Trap Door, then. <laughs> no, that's why I thought The Trap. It's <laughs> called The Rescue. It's the very first one in which uh, Vicky No Pants appears. It's a, as I recall, a two-parter. It's like a super short one. Anyway, there is a rocket ship, and it has a trap door in the floor. Hmm. through which the bad guy conveniently can escape. But why would you have a trapdoor in a rocket ship? And this now, you know, 40-whatever years later in Doctor Who, in the Hooniverse, well, along our timeline, I went, oh yeah, I've seen this before on Doctor Who. This rings a bell. A conveniently placed, would never be here in actual real life, trapdoor. Yeah. Especially as this library is... I mean, now we're skipping ahead to the end, but it, it. it was just built for this girl who isn't even corporeal. No. Or corporeal, or however you say that. <laughs> um, w- words straight out of dictionaries. She, she can just float anywhere through yeah. anything. So, Oh, she... do you think that it was made for her? Like, for for the not toclophane, for the not toclophane? I suppose not, although... Where does the Toclophane go? That doesn't make an appearance in this episode. But anyway, I suppose there are visitors to the library. Fuck, I hadn't thought about that. What happened to the Nottleflane? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Holy I, shit. I've got nothing for you. Because <laughs> she's just a face on a courtesy unit downstairs, rather than a wooden Toclophane now. Unless when he's trying to establish contact with her, or what we assumed was him trying to establish contact with her through the Nottleflane in part one, was actually him trying to repair it because it had broken down and that's why we never see it again. Possibly. Mm. Well, like, maybe she voluntarily shut it down and they just thought it's easier to leave this yeah, maybe out of it. And maybe people will forget and not review the episode in painstaking and detail. Bloody true. I had forgotten about it. If you hadn't said it, I would not have thought about it. Yeah. Very cool. Anyway, sorry. I keep interrupting you. Go for it. Okay, so these 4,022, you know, black round neck visitors to the library. Oh. The library has a dress code. Oh, no, 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 no. They, it, absolutely, this is my, this is my anti-penultimate note. <laughs> okay. My anti-penultimate note is, sorry to interrupt you with this, but it is, why did some of the 4,200 reconstituted save people get coats, others just t-shirts, and why are all of them wearing black? Because they're bibliophiles, man. They're not there dressing to impress. They're all in the emo section of the library? No, <laughs> they, they, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. I think this is the computer choosing the clothes for them. Anyway, yeah, let's get back also, to your thing. they're all clustered in that one bit of the million-kilometer diameter planet. You're right. Of 4,200 people, we actually get to see about 500 of them, minimum. Yeah, yeah they should be s- distanced so far apart that uh, if they were the whole... screaming, none of them would be able to hear each other. Yeah, they should all wake up on this uh, library planet and go, I am possibly the last person alive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And they should all die alone because this place is huge. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's just me and the courtesy unit. I wonder if they give blowjobs. <laughs> That's a perfect... <laughs> Nobody's around. What could be the harm? Like awkwardly trying to bend it over. <laughs> like, why are you so tall? <laughs> that is exactly why they're so tall. <laughs> that bio gloop from last week. They don't need any more gloop. 
Except for the one guy who's reconstituted somewhere close to the core next to the pool of bioglue, like desperately trying to fuck it. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> right. Where, where were we four tangents ago? Seriously, I am very sorry for interrupting you over and over again. Go for it, go for it. These black round neck wearing bibliophiles, they That's have what we were talking about. no need of a trap door. There, there's no maintenance crew on this planet. No. The trapdoor is in... However you look at it, I cannot think of a justification. No, you don't need it. Yeah. That took it down for me. Anyway, yeah, that was it. <laughs> if that <laughs> yeah, wrong the, intonation. That took it down for me. If <laughs> that had mean. been the cliffhanger at the end of the first episode, you yeah. would have been raging like I was raging, surely. Oh, Blech. Yes, absolutely. And that, that, well, I suppose they didn't do that because then it would have had to be a big trapdoor, and that would have been silly. <laughs> a big trapdoor big enough to, for them all to fall down. True, true, true. And then, <laughs> and not only that, we have to address that yeah. he plummets, and you get a good long look down through the trapdoor now. Yeah. And there is nothing down there for thousands of, of meters. He no, must he, fall. No, that's because he falls around a corner. He falls down oh. and left. <laughs> oh, I see. He put a bit of spin on it when he fell. Yeah, I think so. And Which I think makes perfect sense. Corkscrewed through the air. and Physicists in the audience? <laughs> eventually was flying along parallel through a vortex of air to this pipe and then started hand-walking along it. Yeah. Oh. I mean, I don't mind there being a bit of uh, doctor action. By which I don't mean that whole subgenre of porn. I mean the, <laughs> the whole, like, you know, the Doctor is kind of Indiana Jonesing all over the place. I don't mind that. I'm In Classic, who we're currently going through the, the Pertwee years, and he is Mr. Action Man. You know, the, the, this is in the Doc's nature as well. Yeah. So I... I think that's completely fine. I just think it's ridiculous how it happened. Yeah, him falling through the trapdoor was ridiculous, and then him being on a convenient pipe. And also, goodness, I how on earth did he snag that when the pipe is oh, wider God. than the girder beneath it, and he couldn't possibly... <sighs> okay, so in ten minutes of talking about the trapdoor later, I have another question about the trapdoor scene. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Namely, why do the two empty suits look down the trapdoor? Um, the two because they couldn't suits. believe there was a trapdoor there. <laughs> they thought, this must be some sort of optical We're going to continue, illusion. ladies and gentlemen. No, no, but seriously, I mean, there, there's... So, what this tells me is the following. It, it tells me that the only way that the banana rama can see through the, the spacesuits is through the visor. Uh, Right, like they have to oh. look down because they can't, they don't sense it, they don't hear it or whatever. They actually see, and they have to bend down <laughs> in order to look through. And I mean, it's a comical scene. It is fun yeah. that we see these two skeletons peeking down the hole. Like, oh wait, hey, what's Hanna Barbera? But it makes no sense. So, okay, hang on. The, step one. They must see. Step two, they can only see through the visor. Step three, the whole suit is full of banana rama. Step four, this is basically like three kids piled on top of each other wearing a trench coat. Yeah. Because it's, in my mind, the banana rama, <laughs> the Vashta Narada, they are microscopic. I mean, they're tiny, right? Yeah, they're, they're microsporic. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> oh, exactly. There you go. Perfect. So there are billions of them inside a suit. Billions upon billions, right? Yeah, yeah. And you can imagine them like swarms. Just, sh swarms. You can imagine the ones at the top like the two million at the top close to the visor just shouting down <laughs> guys <laughs> left foot <laughs> oh, yeah. and that's why they're moving so slowly because it is literally like you know a bunch of uh, Vashtanrada on each other's shoulders wearing a trench coat yeah it's like every cell in your body has to talk <laughs> to each other before you can do anything exactly <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh. since we're talking about the Vashnarada, and also this scene kind of explains this, the, or the scene that precedes it. Since the Doc has a conversation with them, and I do feel that like, we need to philosophize a little bit about that conversation as well. Indeed. But, but since he has a conversation with them, a singular conversation with a, let's just say, a billion of them. Okay. Does that mean that they have a hive mind? Hmm. Or is... Ahead of every utterance of theirs, is there like a little Vashta Narada, Banana Rama Senate in which they go, is this what we're going to say? Let's, how do we phrase this? Shh, everyone, Bob's going to say <laughs> So, And there's like a half an hour of Phantom Menace style <laughs> bickering <laughs> and politicking before yes, they exactly. come up with a response. Yeah. I don't know. I suppose that's what we have to assume. So it is that. It's not a hive mind. They're not aware of everything. Well, maybe, I don't know, maybe um, the most assertive Vashta Narada Dum? Is that the singular? <laughs> <laughs> Banana Ramum? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, um, perfect. He's got the mic. He's in the thought mail program or whatever, and, and he's not letting hmm. go. Because, you know, 
shit fl- floats to the top. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> shit floats to the top. <laughs> this is me and who back when. <laughs> lovely... Now no longer listenable in America. <laughs> No, that's very interesting. Okay, so do you want to start us off on a little tangent about the conversation that they have? And the fact that they are even able to have a conversation. Oh, well, I was going to tie it philosophically in with the whole, I've got to talk to these people. As I keep saying, you must be sick of it, Podcast Land, wondering where this is going. Because I certainly wonder what's going to happen at the end of the series with this. The Doctor engages the implacable foe. Yeah. And suddenly they're either, uh, they're placable or they ain't. (laughs) But every week it's like, I'm going to put myself in the firing line and talk to these people, no matter how stupid, ridiculous, impossible it is. Yeah. Always impossible, that one. Yeah, we very recently had this in the other double feature, whatever they were called. Some Tarans, there you go. Yeah. 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 Oh, there are lists in the previous episodes of Who Packed When. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Okay, so what about the fact that they actually can have a conversation? So we we talked a little bit about what the echo is in the last review, Mm -hmm. in our review of Silence in the Library. In this one, it seems as though they can access that one faint memory, that echo, dissect it into linguistics and then use it to speak. Yeah, and not only that, but to sustain it and prolong it. Yeah. When they want to for the whole episode. For the whole episode, exactly. I feel like they bent the rules a little bit too much in this one. Either they, I mean, what they could have said is like, all right, so now they use the, uh, just spitballing, maybe the Bananarama uses the echo to absorb the language, and then the echo fades, but they retain the language, and the microphone still works so they can talk. On the microphone, the speaker still works so they can talk. Yeah, the you know? best I can do in this situation is to imagine that a swarm of Fashtanarada act a bit like a neural net. And so they, oh, interesting. Can, they can learn this programming and replicate it in a swarm of themselves. That's a brilliant one. That's a very good, that. very good note. But I agree that, you know, they were pretty much the definition of nebulous in the last episode. Yeah. And suddenly, like you said, you objected to them being given a spaceman sort of bodily form last week you thought we should never see the foe they should remain insubstantial i think it's so much better if you don't see them yeah i I, I maintain that and now not only that but they have the ability to communicate like a a bodily person as well so yeah yeah, they're getting less and less uh unique by the moment absolutely but uh, but i wonder what this says about the echo that's the thing like I, i wonder how much of the person is in this echo you know, because they weren't using... All right, so hang on. Here's a, here's a parallel to other present-day sci-fi. Go for it. I'm going to go with really highbrow sci-fi. Nice. That's what the fans want. Transformers. So, the... Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> Michael Bay's shit series of nonsense films, Transformers, they have... Is it, is it Bumblebee? It might be Bumblebee. It's Some, probably Bumblebee. Someone who loves Transformers hates me for saying this now, if I'm wrong. But let's say Bumblebee isn't able to speak and instead uses snippets of radio and music and whatever to form sentences. Okay. That would have made more sense to me here. So let's say the echo only contains 10 words or 10 words with all of the phonemes, all of the sounds entailed in those 10 words. Now the Vashtanarada only have those sounds and those words to play with. Yeah. And now they have to form sentences and messages using those 10 words. But instead, they can only access 10 words, ever diminishing number of words, by the way, not just 10 now. In five minutes, it's going to be five. But still, they can have a conversation about Kierkegaard in English. Yeah. That's why I'm asking, what is what does this echo actually entail? Is the person inside the echo? Is the full person in the echo? And we can only hear a bit of it. Yeah, the, the, the best example of this uh, recreated elongated mind is Anita. Yeah. Um, yes, very good point. I don't know. I, I, I don't feel like much of the original host, if you like, survives because um, proper Dave instantly degenerates into just a walking zombie murderer. And that didn't seem to be what that guy was about, you know, faintly sketched as he was in episode one. Which is already less than we got from um, Miss Evangelista's Echo. Yeah. In that one, she remembered Donna. She could reason with her. She yeah, could... Donna was like a shining light in her dark darkest hour yeah and yes yeah absolutely and she could tell her like please don't tell the others meaning she remembers the others and she remembers the reason why she was embarrassed in front of them because they're all dicks exactly they were massive knobs the thing is she remembers all that whereas proper dave doesn't remember all he remembers is who turned off the lights yeah and this next one remembers even less no actually it is still proper dave but proper dave can now suddenly 
turn who turned off the lights. To, oh, fuck it. I'm saying the same thing over and over again. But it it's definitely it, stretched. Yes, exactly. And it, and it stretched entirely according to the dictates of where the episode needs to go. So. <laughs> dictates. <laughs> so, so Anita gets to survive just long enough. Um, well, no, I mean, it seems like the Vashta Narada could keep her, you know, keep up the pretense indefinitely, um, waiting for the Doctor to be able to reveal it at a great moment. Yeah. Speaking of dicking Tate. No. Oh! Oh. Shall we jump into Catherine Tate land? Yes, her own little world. Yeah, I'm really sorry for interrupting you, but we spent so much time spent here outside of the what I think is a, the Nexus, by the way. Yeah. Have you seen Star Trek Generations? I have indeed. Possibly the worst of the Star Trek movies, excluding number five. Insurrection Frontier. is terrible. But, oh, uh, wait, hang on. Should we do a very quick tangent and just rank them? Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, crap. Eight. Wait, so, let's start at the bottom. Let's start at the bottom. Okay, let's start, start at the, the bottom. bottom. Bottom, bottom, bottom. Final Frontier. Do you know what? I have a soft spot for that just because... Just okay, you know what? Final sorry, generations then Final Frontier. I'm going with Insurrection. Holy then shit. Generations then Final Frontier. Holy smokes! Yeah. Where where does Nemesis fall for you? Do you know what? Final Frontier just got bumped up another one. <laughs> it's the seventh best. <laughs> Oh shit! You're gonna Holy you're gonna make smokes. me admit that I haven't seen Voyage Home, and then you're gonna be what? Oh, Voyage Home is amaze balls. Yeah. It's wonderful. It's so fun. How is the only one I haven't seen Voyage Home? I need to rectify. That. We need to fix that. Yeah, I will. I will happily have a Voyage Home night with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah cool. Anyway, the best TNG one is clearly at number eight. First contact. First contact. Amazing. A hundred percent. Yeah. Like massive balls. That's up there with with number six. And number two. Number six is amazing. Yes. Undiscovered Country. Yes. Oh, I've seen that a million times and every single time I get a boner. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> when the gravity's turned off. Oh, and the pink blood is floating yeah, in the room. Yeah, it's amazing. Oh. oh, it's so sexy. So, also, obviously, what's her face? So that was our very brief Star Trek <laughs> tangent. Yeah. <laughs> Possibly you're hearing this in July when the bloopers are released. <laughs> <laughs> Mini Star Trek wankathon. <laughs> but yeah, so, I mean, we've both seen Star Trek Generations. We just established <laughs> at length this is clearly the nexus yeah it is a hundred percent the nexus it, what did you think of it what did you think of everything that we get to see in the nexus and i have so many points just said in the nexus in my notes okay well um we should take it roughly in chronological order if there are that many points i liked uh the sudden it, you know it, it did um after the initial massive disappointment yeah. it did divert me a bit in terms of where the episode went. Yeah. I'm glad Moffat kept some things up his sleeve for episode two, rather than it just being one big action scene or one denouement that was, you know, steadily heading inexorably to where exactly where he knew it was going to go. Yeah. I thought that the meat cute under the umbrella, it was it was good. It was weird. <laughs> um, but it, it was sort of like a romantic comedy and yet at the same time extremely unsettling. Interesting. Think. Did you think up until the very end, obviously, that the husband was real or that he was fake? I was certain he was fake. I was certain he was fake as well. Right. I love the Nexus in this one. It's a wonderful idea, ripped off from numerous parts of, you know, the sci-fi universe, including Star Trek. But that's okay if you do it with pizzazz and a little originality. Yeah, and it was certainly done in that fashion in this one. I loved it. I don't necessarily understand all of it. I mean, I don't understand why Dr. Moon, for example, Dr. Moon can just snap his fingers and everything is rectified. You know, like, oh, and then you forgot, and then you remembered. So, I mean, if Dr. Moon can do that, why create this whole narrative? But Well, that's what he's doing. He is, he is retconning the narrative. He is messing with Donna's memory. And while he was doing that, I mean, it made me actually think think about the nature of our memories and how they are distorted. I mean, in Miss Evangelista's face is a, is a bit extreme. Oh, we have to talk about that, that later on as well. But, I mean, if you look back three days ago, the most you're going to remember is sort of skipping from significant point to significant point, like Donna does, but in the present, you can see it happening. Yeah. And it, you know, Moffat's going to take human souls, if he even believes that we have souls, but in the context of Doctor Who, it is allowed that humans have souls. He's going to put them in all kinds of places and manipulate them in all kinds of ways. And yeah, if we do have souls and they are based on our memories, then ah, uh, it just bleh, is where I got to with it. <laughs> I think this is, I mean, to make like the most banal of summaries, Okay, it's the whole mind equals soul 
thing. It's it's oh, yeah. your your consciousness is your intellect, your soul and your moral values and everything that is your intellect. Yeah, and that's how it can be decomposed into binary coding and uploaded to pretty much anything. Exactly. Which is fine. Which is completely fine. We see that in tons of sci-fi. I'm sure we see that in Doctor Who all over the place as well. So I'm not worried about that. I, th- I think it was very well crafted. All of the time jumps were very clever, especially in the Nexus. Yeah. I'm really tired. Boom. Cut to it's bedtime. I'll see you tomorrow at two. Boom. Cut to tomorrow at two. And then they even address it. They say like, no, that happened a couple of seconds ago. You just imagined it. And that's how time works in this place. I thought that was very clever. Yeah. And it went through a very good progression. Yes, it did. When the kids started doing it for Donna, like because they're figments of her imagination, but Miss Evangelista has seeded her with the knowledge. Then her own creations start messing with her mind and she's battling back against them. Oh, that's so interesting because, because, okay, so I... I have one of the questions that I've written down in my notes. You've partly answered it, but but I have a counter argument. Oh, consider what you just said, yeah. and then also consider that all of the children in this in the Nexus are identical, meaning they have been created not by Donna, but by you know Doctor Moon or whatever. My note is: Do you think the fictitious Nexus people, like her kids, are exhibiting her emotional reactions or their own? Because there is a moment, there's a scene, a good night scene, in which they go, "When you're not around, it's like we disappear." appear as well. It's like, we're not in the room either. Is that her coming to terms with what's going on? Or do they actually have a consciousness of their own? In which case, isn't that one of the most cruel things you can imagine? I don't think they have a consciousness of their own. I think when they're in the background, they are just doing what kids do in a playground for instance donna has walked past playground she's seen the kids go down the slides yeah. that's all they're doing they're just playing off her memories exerted from a previous life okay that'd be my guess interesting but i really love the way that the kid knows what's going on and then suddenly they're not there oh it's so that scene by the way yeah sigh good sigh bad i'm sigh. i'm i'm oh i don't even know how to say this well done Catherine tate <laughs> <laughs> That's what it sounds like when Drew comes. Oh, uh, man. Yeah, uh, brava, brava. That was amazing. When her kids disappear, I really felt it. I mean, the, the fear in her, her entire world view, her entire world crumbling before her eyes. Yeah. Horrifying. Shock, horror, desolation. Oh, my goodness. No, she did a fantastic job. Yes. In fact, sorry, hang on. Brief Catherine Tate tangents. Miriam Moore introduced me to the Catherine Tate show on YouTube recently. Was this the comic relief special with David Tennant? Oh, we saw that as well. Substitute teacher. We saw that as well. I thought that was a little bit so-so. Well, yeah, comic relief always is. Yeah, it is. But we also saw some other sketches, like the the posh people sketches. If you haven't seen those, ladies and gentlemen, they're definitely worth watching. Catherine Tate's posh. Just YouTube that. Catherine Tate posh. Uh, Makes you wonder why she didn't do it in uh, Unicorn and the Wasp, but whatever. Yeah, exactly. We, We watched some of those. And I genuinely found some of them really funny. Some of them I found horrendous and just ridiculously donned nobly. But sketch shows are hit and miss. True. But what it what it showed me was, and I told Miriam with this as well, like, holy smokes, she can act. Catherine Tate can act. It's not that she's a bad actress. It's that she has made some of the worst acting choices imaginable in her portrayal of Donna Noble. Or she was given the notes and she had to do it that way. Or she could have gone, wait, hang on, let's just do another take. Yeah. And And then the production crew would have gone, holy smokes, that's way better than what you're doing right now. And then RTD leaned over and said, we're going with the first one. (laughs) Okay, that is possible. Regardless, I still dislike Donna Noble. Yeah. But Catherine Tate, I, I see her in a different light now. Thank you, Miramu. There you go. Yeah, thanks, Miri. It only took <laughs> till episode 10, but we're getting him on board. <laughs> I've got a couple of questions about Donna Noble. Actually, this isn't so much about Donna Noble, but about her life. How did Dr. Moon decide to pair up those two? Because he is a real person, the husband. Yeah. He is a real person. He's been bumming around for a century. Yeah, yeah, you're right. He's been going fishing. <laughs> He's had a stutter for a century. By the way, he, he probably... Dr. Moon could have fucking fixed his stutter, by no, the no, way. No. This that guy... is a shitty job, Dr. Moon. <laughs> 
He's got a lot of patience to take care of. But this guy, he used to he used to speak like Richard Burton. He no, to, he did not. No, he did. But over a hundred years, because he was so isolated, he forgot how to communicate with other human beings. No, go on. What, were you, what was your contention? I have no contention. I'm just wondering how Doctor Moon decided to pair them up. Like, what is the algorithm behind Doctor Moon that goes, mm, "This guy is a stutterer, and this one has big knockers. I will pair them together, and, then, <laughs> and they can live in the Nexus forever and ever and ever." <laughs> Well, I mean, he is a matchmaking program. I mean, I don't know. Maybe he was just the odd one out. Maybe at the beginning it was like, we're all going to pick teams. Or, yeah. or Dr. Moon hosted a speed dating event. And he was the only one at the end who was left unselected. Because it makes you wonder a little bit, doesn't it? Like, it makes you wonder, has everyone been paired up? Or are some people having relationships forever and ever with fictitious creations of Dr. Moons or of their own? Ooh, uh, Dr. Also- Moons in the mix. That's why he's always leaving. <laughs> <laughs> is Dr. Moon allowing some people to be single? Well, if this guy is single, then... Uh-huh. Has this dude been single for a hundred years and now he's met someone? And Dr. Moon is going like, no, it's way better if, if we pair them up. It, you know, if fewer resources are required for me to maintain those illusions, I will have two of them share one illusion. Yeah. Great. Oh, I see. Yeah. What about, okay, is there someone out there in the library among the 4,200 people? 4,022. Sorry, 4,022. Oh, 4,022. Which is an even number, by the way, and Donna makes it 4,023, so there must be some There's someone out there. There's definitely element. someone out there either uh, well, I mean, there might be a bigamist out there somewhere, <laughs> or a few of them, or possibly someone is single. What about people who are too young or too old to fit into Dr. Moon's mold? Oh, cool. Are there gay relationships in the Nexus? Or does Dr. Moon just go, everyone lives in the same house? Because, by the way, we only see two families in houses, and it's the same house. We only see... Two families with children, same children. Mm. Like, does that mean that the females that he has absorbed, they're all homemakers taking care of the same two children in the same flat while the husband goes out and works in a job that doesn't exist and comes back? And by the way, while he's away, does Dr. Moon create a job for him that requires him to wear a suit and carry around a briefcase? Because he comes home. With a, in a suit with a briefcase. Oh, there's so much more to this Nexus, right? Yeah, there's a whole series. That's my point! Nexus. I mean, That's now- my point, and that's why I assume that he was fake, because clearly he wasn't going somewhere to a job, right? And if yeah, he is going yeah. to a job, is he meeting other people who are in the Nexus? Yeah, I mean, oh, I suppose if you're going to have the surprise reveal that, wow, he's actually real, you have to sketch him thinly enough that he, he could be fake. Mm. So he was constrained from making any sense is what I'm saying and that's so I'm true. trying to wriggle out of answering this question <laughs> no I think that's a very very fair answer does everyone wake up in the same hospital well I mean they there are more children in the park we don't see other parents in the park but are mm. there other people there with their kids quote unquote and they're all stuck in the nexus we just don't see them in frame yeah I mean it's it's, a, it's an interesting question whether um, it takes up less memory because there's a constraint on the computer's memory yeah. despite being the biggest data core in the history of the universe yeah well he also needs to keep as we have already learned bridget jones and harry potter yes yeah. yes yes so yeah so does it take less memory to have a template world replicated across 4022 people presumably or, or when they're all mixed together and you have to i don't know are, are all their reactions taking up ram and processing power <laughs> i mean because that's gonna multiply apply exponentially incredibly quickly yeah so yeah. absolutely i guess there are, there are just many little playground levels dotted across this world that never meet up i, I find it incredibly interesting two more things sorry i'm sorry two more Go things about it. the same the same world first this off is a big part of this episode which, it is which Catherine tate carries <laughs> she does she yeah. does a great job okay when she leaves the nexus or rather was skipped all the way to the end of the entire episode yeah donna is denied the love of her life as is her husband yeah brusquely brutally i mean she doesn't know she's if for all she knows he was just a figment of her imagination the doctor thinks that she's a massive narcissist because he thinks that the husband was a figment of her imagination as well but we the viewers know that she has been denied true love yeah does she ever I mean, I don't think that she bumps into him again. I think this is it. But <laughs> if if he were, if they were to end up together, and yeah. there's there's nothing the Doctor won't do when it comes to the end of a character's arc. That's true. <laughs> but he doesn't know that that Len, Len is his name, or Ken, something like that, 
He doesn't know he exists. Yeah. So were he to set that up, then that would be retconning and objectionable. And by the way, imagine the heartache of, let's just call him Len for for the sake of it. Yeah. Lovable Len. Lovable Len sees Donna. He sees Donna. He knows that she is real. And then he is beamed elsewhere. Delectable Donna. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) And that means he will materialize wherever he is sent and go, holy shit, I have been robbed of the love of my life, who is a very real person. And he will never see her again. He may even go off looking for her. He will never find her as far as we're aware. He is way more tragic a character than she is. Because he knows what he's lost, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Exactly! Oh, yeah, that just hit me. Oh, Holy smokes. Ouch. God, this is such a good episode. Okay. It is, but at the same time, I <laughs> I didn't really like it when he turned up and was real. Because she's... I mean, did she just mishear his name because of his stutter all those years? His stutter, which they cured, actually, so that wouldn't have worked. And she's like, checked all the records. There's no Len. Let's push off, shall we? And Len's like, I'm here! Oh! That's oh, wait, hang on. Does she check the records? Yeah, she... She says, you're right, she says that, doesn't she? Yeah, no one called Len was in the library that day. That means that Dr. Moon gave him a fake name. <laughs> Yeah. Not only has Len just awoken and gone, I was in love with this woman and I will never see her again for as long as I live. But he also goes, what the shit am I? Like, I don't even know myself. I spent a hundred years as someone else, as Len. (laughs) Ah, you know what it is? Because because people are distorted slightly when they're uploaded to the library in a state of emergency. He was called Ken. (laughs) (laughs) And if she'd only checked for Ken in the records, he'd have been there. A fucking Donna. Such an idiot. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Okay, so there are there are more parts of uh, the Nexus, though. Yeah. There's also... Actually, I don't know if this counts as the Nexus. We have Cal's pads, Cal's mm. flats, and Cal's dad's. Yeah, her erstwhile dad. Yeah, I, I, have, I have two notes about her, by the way. First off, the manifestation of what she considers paternity equals doing the dishes. Mm. That's yeah. what the dad does. That's what dads do, apparently. They just do the dishes constantly. <laughs> And let in the psychologist. (laughs) Yeah, and sort of amble around the flat ineffectually. Yeah, doing dishes. Mm, Uh, And the second thing is no self-respecting, what is she, by the way, 10 years or something? Ish. Ish. No self-respecting, let's say, 10-year-old would choose the soundtrack of that TV show. Oh, hang on, hang on. We got in trouble, didn't we? Uh, No, you got in trouble. Why? At Christmas for saying that um, little superhero guy was was, 10 when he was 8. He was 8. I'm going to go with this girl being 8. Okay, fine, she's 8. I'm rubbish at deciphering people's ages yeah, what in general. Can, what can we say, Podcast Land? We don't spend our time looking at children online. Yeah, oh well. Sue us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so she looks at the telly and she sees what is like Downton Abbey or, you know... <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and it's actually Dr. Moon TV. And she's at- added this soundtrack to it. She also sees bits of the, the library. Like, she sees the Doctor in our favorite scene, the trapdoor scene, with Indiana Jones music in the background, like action adventure music. Yeah, yeah, and she's standing in for the audience of children a few times over this double feature. Exactly. So, why is she picking this music? Like, has she not seen... No, it... No, anyway. Yeah, it's it's actually not even worthy of... It's not a talking point, it's just... Just a, a note. <laughs> it, it bugged me. Yeah, it's a beef. You're an ounce of beef. Yeah, I just beefed. I just beefed. <laughs> <laughs> beef everywhere. <laughs> Shall we jump back into well, the library? No, no, no. We got Miss Evangelista to oh, cover. You're right. As she covers herself. Miss Evangelista's fate, to me, it establishes that either you're pretty or you're intelligent, but you are never the two at once. I hadn't put that together, but... That is exactly what message that sends. Yeah. I don't like it. I I don't like that she has to sacrifice her beauty to be intelligent and that it is so clearly verbalized by her that that is the case. Oh, I lost my my good looks, but now people can take me seriously. And by the way, I'm also super clever. Whereas previously I was great at boning, but now I... (laughs) But but I was an idiot. Like it, it... no. Also, if if Bugs she me. is so clever now that she is correct in saying that her IQ score moved a decimal point, then <laughs> she must have gone from 16.4 
to 164. <laughs> yeah. She, she wouldn't have been able to speak, is my point. She would have been sub-moron well, beneath I imbecile. Mean, I'm assuming that the idea is that previously she was exactly average. She was 100. and Or actually, no, sorry. Previously she was sub-average. Yeah. Uh, let's make it 90. And now she's 900. 900? Come yeah. off it. I kept it realistic. 164 is genius level. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Wait, which scale are you using? The Cattell scale? Oh, shit. You know more about this than I do. <laughs> I'm I mean, using the Drew scale. It's very applicable. I took it to mean, oh, she's basically a computer. She's, yeah. you know what it is? She even talked a bit like a computer. In yeah, space. you're right. You're right. Except that we don't get to see all of the computations. We don't get to see the intelligence behind it. We just see, oh, the mystery. She's Morpheus, you know. She's, yeah, yeah. Uh, she's in the dream world. Uh, this is Morpheus of Matrix fame, not Morpheus, the, <laughs> the actual dream chap. Uh, right. But I think she's meant to be way cleverer than we actually get to see her. Did you like her, though, as a, you know... A well, she's sort of the... Dream guide <laughs> character. She's a very Moffaty character. Oh, in, explain. In that, you know, Moffat loves his own cleverness and cleverness itself. Yeah. I mean, that's his raison d'etre, isn't it? And that's why he made Sherlock and why he had to introduce character after character that was cleverer than the last... And make up, and I'm leading round to trivia with this. Oh, interesting. Make up Sherlock's older sister <gasps> okay. called Yoros. Yes. Director of this episode is called Yoros Lynn. What? And the last episode, and I think other Moffat episodes that he wrote for who? I think Yoros Lynn did Blink as well. Oh, wow. So that is exactly who that must be named after. Oh, that is really cool. That yeah. is really cool. Okay, interesting. Yeah. And you've got you've got Sherlock you've got all these people who are who are clever and are unloved and are basically how I think Moffat conceives of the perfect human being, the perfectly rational, yeah. sort of unbiased, unaffected, unclouded, giant brain of a person. You know, who has no time for stupid delusions. Can like we say love. That there are a few parallels between Euros, Sherlock's sister, and Cal? In this one. Ooh, explain, elaborate. Well, we have someone who is locked in a cell, so to speak. This person is stuck in a computer, has full control over the, the external worlds. She has access to knowledge, manipulates people, etc., yeah. etc. Et yeah, and yeah. Maybe, maybe this is something we should look out for across Moffat's future uh, female characters. I mean, maybe not in the companions so much, but, mm. but you know, they, this character is definitely, so it's definitely got Moffat's stamp on it. Yeah. And, well, and it, I found it quite hard to see past that, and also it was quite you know an exposition dump of a character <laughs> definitely uh, i have one more question about her yeah couldn't she have been reconstituted as well what like she was at the end she wasn't though yes yeah, she was no she wasn't she was still in the nexus i mean why um, isn't she wearing a black coat slash t-shirt in the library and is now a super intelligent ugly person because you can only be one of the two i tell you what if they can restore her face at the end, to give River her happy ending, yeah. then I don't see any reason why they couldn't reconstitute her wholly. By the way, the hang flesh. on. Wait, wait, wait. I hadn't even thought about this. Thank you for bringing that up. Mm. The version of Miss Evangelista in River's world, who has her old face back, she's the old Miss Evangelista, isn't she? She's idiot Evangelista. Presumably. She's yes. not the real, quote-unquote, real Evangelista who is clever and now deformed. Yeah. So there are two versions of Evangelista at the end of this story. There's one who's just sort of roaming the Matrix, roaming the Nexus as Morpheus, and then there is, because she's clearly stuck there, because otherwise she would be wearing a black coat and be real and now could go off to have, like, an amazing life. <laughs> super clever. Uh, and then there's this other one who is a facsimile of Miss Evangelista who is just dumb, pretty and dumb. Yeah. In fact, all of River's friends henceforth are fake. I suppose they... With the exception of possibly Cal, if the two were to become friends. Yes. Oh, okay. It's tricky, isn't Does it? Does that make it... sense? I feel like that makes because, perfect sense. Because Cal, she, um, I was gonna say that, oh, okay, well, they're just figments of River's imagination then, but Cal makes a point of saying, and I've given you these friends. Okay, question for you. Among those friends, do we not see proper Dave? Yeah, proper and, Dave, and Anita. And what's her face? Anita, yeah. And, uh, other Dave? They're clearly people who we know 
now have died. Their yeah, their yeah. minds were never absorbed by, a, sorry, saved by the library. Yeah, they were not saved. They're all fake. She's yeah. living in the Nexus, and she should have one of those Picardian moments of enlightenment in which she goes, "Oh my God, this is none of this is real. Those aren't my nephews opening their Christmas presents in a perpetual Christmas. This is." All of this is fake, yeah. right? But instead, she chooses to do the Kirk thing and always have w- whatever they are, Andorian eggs for breakfast. Not Andorian. Oh, not Andorian, but terrible. Such a Kirk. Oh. Ugh. God damn it, River. Never never took you for a Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just the eternal head nest. Yeah. Oh, 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 shit. Hang on. One more question about River in Nexus. Please. Who is the hobby in River's Nexus, Pat? Because she has fake kids, but she has... So she must have a hobby, right? Because she has three kids. Does she? Yeah, there are three beds in that final scene. There absolutely are. Oh, and really? I wondered... I mean, I assumed that one of them was Cal. Although I didn't get a brilliant <gasps> look at it. Whoa, that's super clever. And that the other two were probably... Tate's they were just templates. yeah. They were just the standard, exactly cookie cutter kids. Yeah, interesting. Does that mean that River is now in Doctor Moon's world, married to Cal's fake dad who does the dishes all day long? Maybe, oh, and maybe shit. Cal asks, uh, "Are you my mummy?" <laughs> Over and over again. <laughs> oh, God. All right. <laughs> okay. Let's have a quick chat about uh, River. We, we've we recorded for a while now. We haven't actually talked about River Song. Wow. Okay. Well, she has two big scenes in this one. Yeah. The first one I thought completely bombed. Wait, is this the whisper scene? The whisper scene. Where she whispers his name. No. No, oh, that was a good one. That was a good no, one. Okay. No, she had two monologues. And one of them, she was talking about how impossible he was to Anita. Yeah. And going on about... Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, and she sort of recapped it better at the end, and <laughs> it really fell flat for me, that one. And you clearly don't remember it well, so... <laughs> I do remember it. It's uh, where he then comes in towards the end and goes, oh, spoilers. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, over the two, it's not the strongest. <laughs> okay. But it's still a good scene in my view. All right. I think she does a great job in this. The only thing that bugs me is that, and I can only assume that she has been like a hundred percent Stepford wived towards the end when she's in the Nexus. But the only thing that bugged me was that she was so complacent. Like, oh, right, I'm going to spend eternity in this fucking digital bubble with fake friends and kids that aren't mine, but she's super happy. You know, well, that bugged me. She's just happy to be alive because she has known that her last meeting with the doctor is coming and she has, you know, throughout the whole night on Derillium, however long that was conceived to be at this point and then stretched by Moffat yeah. in his sneaky way. She, she has known that her death is approaching. The doctor wouldn't divorce her. She knows him better than that. Um, so, yeah, any anything is a bonus. Do you know what this makes me think as well? What? It makes me feel like there's an option to revive her. You know, not next Doctor, not two Doctors from now. At some point in the future, the Doctor could just go back to the library and go, oh yeah, wait, hang on. All we need is like teleporter technology <laughs> or a 3D printer and we'll make her. Yeah. And yeah. she'll be alive again and she can be a character and we can have a, a happy marriage. Or yeah, possibly three- she can just go and do her thing. And with a 3D printer, you can weird science it. Massive boobs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Catherine <Yes>. takes <laughs> boobs on Alex Kingston. Oh my goodness. <laughs> You're going to hear that noise again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what I was going to say was, what this felt to me was like a way of telling the viewers, yes, we did write by this character in the sense of she's no longer part of the show, but it's still a happy ending. But at the same time, we're keeping our options open because if at any point we run out of material or we really, really need to pull in some emotional leverage, we have her. We can resuscitate her. We can revive her, you know. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, it may I wouldn't be... be surprised if she comes back. I would. Really? Given that they did build it up to this. What climax. if she comes back not as a 
physical being, but if she comes back as, you know, the lawnmower man <laughs> kind of uh, character. Well, I mean, she could, she and Kylie could go floating around in space as glittery stardust having adventures. There is that, yeah. I mean, Kylie Minogue <laughs> is basically the, the hippie version, right? <laughs> Whereas a River Song is now the nerd version, the actual version of the, the lawnmower man. Like, I can see, actually, you know what? I can see Miss Evangelista returning, where she's just Take, she's now the internet and she's walking around in cyberspace just fiddling with shit all over the place <laughs> you know the TARDIS makes noise why is that oh it's because it's hooked up to the local Wi-Fi and that's Miss Evangelista or yeah. possibly that's River Song possibly I think I think Moffat's got more sense than that I think the showrunners know that to do that would be suicide okay fair enough <laughs> <laughs> Because wouldn't it? I mean, maybe after they've given her this massive epoch-defining send-off. Well, uh, <clears throat> Rose. Yeah, oh shit! You got me there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come the sixtieth. Oh, yeah, exactly. They're all gonna be in it. Exactly. Yeah, and you're gonna make that noise again. The the. <laughs> <sighs> all right. Well, oh, the, oh yeah. Sorry. Go I for do it. have one point about River Song. Yeah. I mean, she is on her last legs. That is the last few drops of River Song that the doctor <laughs> is pumping into the computer once he's run the length and breadth and depth <laughs> of the library. Oh my god, Sonic Boner alert. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, she is degrading. Yeah. That, that is the advanced stage exactly. of dementia, River exactly. Song. You're right. You're, that, oh my god, that's so That's right. River Song just going, ice cream, ice cream, ice cream. <laughs> Forever. Yeah. <laughs> and Cal going, oh shit, that's now my mum. <laughs> oh god, no, that's terrible. She I didn't think never about Never short that. of ice cream. <laughs> but, th okay, so this is another thing where, or, or another take on the echo. The thing that we were saying at the very start of this review, there are too many versions of the echo. Yeah. You know, the echo can mean too many different things. And it, it turns out in, in River's case, it, it means as long as there's even one blinking light, you have the whole person there, the whole personality and the whole intellect. You know why that is, though? Because of the sonic dampers. I don't know. Oh. Wow. <laughs> Whatever. That was dreadful. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's as, as much thought as Moffat put into it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I only have two more notes in my, on my list. Is there anything else that you want to discuss? Dude, I haven't looked at my notes in 45 minutes. I am so impressed. <laughs> I mean, I am... I'm proud of you. Thanks, man. <laughs> and we've only got two hours to go. <laughs> Let's open them up. Okay, so I'll start off with one of them, and that is that the whisper scene, I think, is wonderful, since we're talking about River. Oh, yes! She knows his name. She knows his name! It's... Do you, oh. know, do you know the one scenario in which the Doctor would say his name. Apparently it's only... Uh, it's, it's when he's about to come, and he shouts out his own name. Because <laughs> his, like, oh, <laughs> his ego's... Because his ego's that big. <laughs> That's what gets him off. <laughs> Not Rivers. <laughs> You're right. He's like, oh, the only person who would ever know my name is the person I boinked. The <laughs> that, that's fantastic. Mm, even though I suppose his name has been mentioned, not yeah, to us. The name of the doctor. Yeah, not to us. We don't know it, but it has been uttered. You don't need to be married to him to know it, but regardless, uh, it lends so much gravity. It, gravity is shit. It lends so much gravitas to the, like, just the, the legend, you know, the, the, the meaning of his ma name, the weight of his name. Yeah, and that is, like River was in, in you know, impressively set up in this episode. That, yeah. This is Moffat laying the groundwork for five years of Doctor Who in I one doubleheader. Very impressive. I wonder how much he knew at that point, or how much he had spitballed, yeah. red-stringed and jammed. You know Moffat does that as well. Oh, definitely. A hundred percent. He's Scottish, he's probably marmalade. <laughs> <laughs> Purpose. Uh, <laughs> do you want to bring up anything else? I've only got one more thing. Um, well, just to say that that second scene between, you know, Alex Kingston's second acting big scene. Is that the actual she sacrifice? Is, she is sat in the chair. Yeah. That scene for me was worthy of, like you say, legend. It was a scene worthy of this enormous expanded universe yeah. that we are trying... And bear in mind, this is the first time, or well, the second time that we see. Yeah. Yeah, and we are coming to it with years of, oh, now we know the, the full sort of... Yeah, but imagine Important. that you don't. I mean, I don't remember the full chronology of River Song, but I can still feel the the legend. I can feel the gravitas of her presence. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, her sacrifice is meaningful to me. Compare that to, let's say, Anita or Proper Dave or someone. We've only known them for exactly as long as we have known River Song. I don't give a shit if they die. But River Song, oh my God, I I can feel their whole marriage suddenly coming to an end. Yeah. And and this scene for me, I suppose I can best put it as I could watch another 10, 20 years of Doctor Who and this would probably still be up there as one of the, yeah. you know, turning points, the moments yeah, that exactly. stand out in the history of this, you know, unique series. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That was really good. And Tennant's acting in that scene, he raises his game. He does. Yeah, he doesn't get louder. He doesn't shout. He's not full cap. He doesn't have to do the whole teeth thing. <laughs> no, clenching the jaw. Ugh. No, he just he just nails it. Yeah. Spot on, both of them. Yeah. Well done. Oh, I'm getting ficklemmed over here. <laughs> it was it was really good. I have one note that's in all caps. Oh shit, Rivers knocked out the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Because I think I dipped in and out of this episode in 2008 long enough to realize, oh, wait, this is the second of a two-part. I know nothing about what's going on. I'm going to stop. So I had not seen that. Oh, wow. And she just lamps him and lays him out. And wow. (laughs) Talk about Moffat and his surprises. I mean, that's never happened, presumably. Well, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Yeah, not that I can think of anyway. JD, if you're listening, let us know. Yeah, exactly. The, the yeah okay I, I've got one more scene uh, towards the end in yeah. fact there's a, a, a fair bit of overlap that really gave me goosebumps and that's the snap of his fingers scene oh yes but only the first one not the one where he snaps his fingers and the doors close because at that point it's like no oh, I get it like, yeah. stop showing off <laughs> but, but matching what she was telling him like oh he could just open the TARDIS with a snap of his fingers like no no one can do that well you can and then he does just because he knows her now and he believes her and he believes in himself, I guess. It, that's amazing. Yeah. I think that was an absolutely stunning scene. The Doctor could learn a lesson in humility there. That's probably why he marries her. He realizes that I'm not my perfect self. Yeah. Someone can bring that out of me. Yeah. yeah. I speak as someone nice. whose, whose wife is in the next door through the wall. Hi, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Watching a film with Mirami right now. <laughs> Except she's listening. Whatever. (laughs) You know they are. (laughs) Who wouldn't? (laughs) Anything else on your list? Oh, there is loads. Oh. We don't need to go through this episode again. Let me find something good. Okay. Oh, River would trust Doctor to the end of the universe. And they've been. Oh. She says. You know, fitting in with Derek Jacobi, Six Billion Toclophane, me, Clara Oswald, River Song, and presumably all 13 Doctors to this point. I mean... Maybe, maybe the end of the universe isn't how I've always conceived it, because I've always thought of it, having grown up on Douglas Adams, as yeah. l- taking place in one location, like Millaways. Yeah, exactly. But presumably it's some sort of pan-cosmic closure event, so that they can keep going back to, so say, the end of the universe and stuffing it with more and more lore. Because otherwise, how the hell does it work? Well, we've seen, and we will have seen, I mean, there, there's so much classic Who that, that we haven't explored yet on this show, but there's there are so many different views of the end of the world that even we are aware of. Just like there are so many different views of the end of the Earth. That, that we are aware of. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's it's such an amazing point in time, obviously. It's a milestone. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? Visit it once and never again? You're obviously going to revisit it. You have to add to it a little bit more than just one single episode. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I, I get why, why that would be one of those events. You know, a pin in the map. Yeah. Mm. When is it that River Song goes to the end of the world? Well, perhaps we don't get to see that, or at least maybe it's just one of their adventures between, you know, inter episodes. Yeah, like Picnic on Asgard, and yeah, exactly. Whatever else we haven't seen. Picnic on Asgard. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, surely you'd go to Valhalla. No, that's where the feast is. Valhalla is the afterlife, dude. Oh, true. But isn't Asgard where the gods live anyway? Yeah, Asgard is like the Mount Olympus, and Valhalla is yeah paradise. where the hog roasts are. Yeah, you're right. Get it's on where, there. Where <laughs> Obelix gets his catering done. The uh, <laughs> right, hit me with a good one. I liked the scene. Were you um were you surprised by Proper Dave showing up? That why are there six in the room when there should be five? Oh yeah, because I thought that was kind of like that 
video that's online where it's like follow the people throwing the uh, basketball around have you seen this video no and you following the basketball with your eyes and it's a, it's just a video and this guy in a gorilla suit walks from one side of the frame to the other and because you're following the basketball you don't see them you don't see the guy in the gorilla suits like front and center just and i think that's what moffat moffat must have been aware of something like that he's he's messing with your perception a lot in this in this uh I, serial well i would have to go back and re-watch that scene but i have a feeling that we never get to see all of them until he says how many there are yeah probably yeah and you know what even if even if we do then yeah i guess it's clever but it's not so clever because who's going to start counting them they all look the same because they're all wearing the same spacesuit that's that's true. It seems it's one of those things that seems clever in the moment, but when you look back on it, maybe not so much. Mm. Okay, that wasn't a good oh, one. Sure. Let me find a really good one. Oh, do it. Yeah. Anecdote me. Bullet point me, dude. Right. Micro spores. Yeah. That's who the Vashta Narada are. But we haven't talked about how this was their original planet, and they got put in the books. Wait. And yeah. Wait. I mean, they. I didn't know if it was their original planet. Is that actually said? I. I think this is where they originated from. Hence, why there are a million million of them. I took it to be the whole planet as is actually man-made. You know, it's artificial. Well, it is. They. It used to be forested, and then really, they, I think so. And then they cut. To, I, I assume th- that they imported their wood from somewhere or you know on some planets with forests there's also a paper mill <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and sense. they just went to the wrong forest <laughs> well i tell you what one of us will be right if i maintain that it was on this planet yeah. so either way one of us is right you so, know what? i'm gonna go to tardis wiki and, and find out but that explains i did not foresee them being the life forms somehow because yeah. they were that insubstantial they were that incorporeal that my mind didn't extend that far i thought moffat probably did that intentionally as well to catch out thickies like me who are just looking for anthropoids <laughs> did you see it coming did you see them being the million million because i mean i thought it might be the books somehow but not the micro spores in the books uh, uh, the thing is i remembered that oh okay i don't i can't remember what i thought back in 2000 and whatever but i definitely remembered that there was something living in the books and i remember the whole like forest of the dead being forest wood paper but yeah but i remember that connection but then spores Spores. Spore, you have to go to spores as well. Yeah. But I suppose you... Okay, here's another thing. It's actually said in the... Oh, I had to re- be reminded of this on um, TARDIS Wikia. But it's actually said in the episode, this one or possibly the prior episode, that they live on a billion worlds, including the Earth. Yeah. They are everywhere. Yeah, and they live off roadkill, which is weird because cars have only been around for 100 years. But <laughs> Sorry, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, actually, super good point. How did they come to this planet on, like, a, a, some asteroid-sized steak <laughs> the, <laughs> that somehow didn't burn burn up in re-entry? They, they the, came because people are always stealing books from this massive library. They think no one's going to notice <laughs> one's missing. And then their and then planet we, gets eaten. Yeah, and one of them just goes, ah, oh, fuck it, it's recyclable, and throws it into a forest on the Earth. And it's like, oh, well, great, now the Earth is overpopulated by fucking banana ramas. The <laughs> point being, they are not indigenous to this planet, which I feel also lends credence to the the idea that this planet is artificial. It makes sense. The core is a computer. The core is not a planet core. There's not like yeah. magma and shit if you dig down. There's just a hard drive. Yeah, a not very big hard drive. Yeah. Were you disappointed with the size of the ball of fire? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And why doesn't it get hotter if you go down there? And why? No, oh, it's just no. Yeah, I mean, I I liked the look of the gravity. Loved it. Uh, Loved or whatever it. it was called. Yeah. And the Doctor flying well, like Superman down. down, down oh, that yeah. is such a gorgeous scene. Beautiful scene. And he is, I mean, goodness, t- t- like Tennant loves to shout, he loves to Tom Cruise it down that corridor with his long legs that Tom yeah. Cruise doesn't have. <laughs> And that, that looked really good. He was, he was, you know, you've seen a lot of people run in films, but he was fucking pegging it. Yeah, he was. You could tell. Oh, I liked it. Okay. Okay, hit me. This is another beef I have. All right. The doc realizes the people have been saved. No one says saved. No one says 4,020 people have been saved. Yeah, everyone says that. Everyone says that all the time. Yeah. 
Uh, do you know the, the relatively established phrase, save our souls? Not rescue our souls. Like, oh, this person is sending a classic ROS. No, <laughs> it's a very established word. Yeah, used yeah. in exactly the way the doctor denies it's used. I, yeah. I, I, don't know, I don't know how that made it into the final episode. I really don't. <laughs> I mean, was that just not redrafted? And they were like, there's no time now. Production schedule's tight. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. Now that Ooh. you love... I mean, this might not be the last one. Now that you love Donna, right? Yeah. You said that, right? Something uh, like that. No. I Pretty much the same Did I that. just say yeah? I didn't mean yeah. I don't love Donna. I, okay, okay. I hate Donna, but, what but about, I think she does a good job. But what one. about when... Um, Mr. Evangelista is saying none of it's real and Donna says no it, it can't be it must be I've been dieting <laughs> <laughs> I do remember that that's kind of fun yeah <laughs> yeah that was <laughs> yeah her husband's name is Lee by the way Lee I'm sorry I'm just looking Len. at the trivia over here can I interject with some trivia yes uh, I just realised I haven't touched upon my trivia file at all this is taken straight from IMDb. I've not looked at that this week yet. There might be more there. But, I mean, we've already talked about the, the zombies, the, the very zombie-esque nature of uh, the Vashna Narada when they put on a... A spacesuit. A coat, uh, <laughs> a trench coat, and, and meander down the corridors of a library. Yeah, in weird skulls that are not quite human. Not quite human. They're way too wide. I wonder if the glass somehow just distends, if it's an optical illusion. Maybe. They've but, got weird stuff going on at the back of their jaws. It's, yeah. It's odd. Yeah, you are right. Yeah. Anyway. The, but, but, okay, so the title of this episode is Forest of the Dead, which is very, very zombie-like to me. It feels very Romero-esque. You know, Night of the Living Dead, Day of the Dead, Dawn of the Dead, Forest of the Dead. Right, right. In fact, here are some working titles for this episode. We had The Doctor Runs, Forest of the Night, Rivers Run, and Return of the Dead. A working title of this was Return of the Dead, which is, I mean, you know... That's the most Moffaty title I've ever heard. What, Return of the Dead? Yeah. I mean, that's what happens in, um... Oh, they're all heaven sent or something and hell bent, but they're all death in heaven. Death in Heaven. I feel like Life of the Dead would be a good Moffat title. But, but oh, we're Return so of... getting that next year. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Return of the Dead sounds to me like just the... Return of the Dead. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to get sued, but we are remaking Return of the Living Dead. Oh, kind of, yes, yes, you know? yes. Okay, so that's, that's number one. Number two, we've already referred to her as the runaway bride. The wedding dress that Donna wears in this episode, it is the same one that she wore in The Runaway Bride. Oh, nice. That's impressive. That's a nice little just connection. I mean, right? obviously, it's the one wedding dress they have in the costume department. Yeah. But even so... <laughs> that fits her. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, a massive jock. <laughs> God, this review has been jogtastic. Okay, so... <laughs> we uh, should do this more often. <laughs> we absolutely should. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing, so her husband, Lee, this would have been an interesting twist, but it would have required tons more exposition. A just... whole lot more leeway. <laughs> <laughs> ka <-ching. laughs> Reading off IMDb Trivia. A twist revelation in which Donna's artificial reality husband, Lee turned out to be an overweight woman in the real world was excised for fear of being too confusing. Oh yeah, that would have taken quite some explanation. Well, I mean, I, I think it would have been a fantastic idea, where it's like, oh wait, what you see of yourself in the Nexus might be how you perceive yourself. Yeah. Like, more Matrixy in a way. It's a projection of your ego, you know. Yeah. Well, Shit. people do it in Second Life. Well, they did. I don't know if Second Life is still going. Yeah, exactly. I mean, my point is basically the, the way that you portray yourself on the internet in the real world world isn't necessarily who you are in real life and very possibly that could have been added as an extra dimension to this episode but holy smokes that would have requ required so much more exposition yeah it would have really slowed down the ending and you need some if you're not going to visualize it in some way you need this woman to explain i'm lee yeah. no i'm lee lee I, lee's a unisex name is it they're, are they girls i guess it is yeah lee? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Jamie Lee Curtis? Yeah, why not? I guess that's a surname. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm sorry. And then Donna has to react to it, and yeah. goodness, how's Donna going to react to it? I mean, not well, yeah. presumably. I mean, it would. It, you're right, it would open up a whole new dimension of gender perceptions and Donna's character, but... Yeah, I but mean, it would have been too much. They're already yeah. squeezing so much into this episode. You know, enough is enough. I've got yeah. one more piece of trivia, and this backs up what I said in part one. Really? According to Stephen Moffat, the squareness gun is the sonic blaster used by Jack Harkness in season one. After Jack leaves it in the TARDIS, River Song will take the gun in the Doctor's future. It is not just... 
like Captain Jack's cut and paste gun. It is Captain Jack's cut and paste gun. Right. Okay. Well, I'd sort of. Oh, you assumed that already. I assumed that. I mean, only having seen the one gun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. <laughs> Simplest fair enough. answer. <laughs> I mean, okay, sorry. That you, brings me back. Stuff. That brings me back to the damn beginning again. Oh, here we I go. I mean, but couldn't they have done the beginning better? Because, like I say, this ruined twenty minutes of the episode for me. I mean, I, I came up with three ideas, and maybe you can come up with better ones. Okay, let's hear it. One, use the negotiation with the Vashta Narada now via the neural relay tactic. Buy some time, then something clever happens, and then you can avoid the trap door later on. I think they had already written the whole trap door scene, or possibly they had already thought of the whole trap door scene. I agree with you, that would have been so much better to have that conversation now. But I'm almost willing to bet that that was already entertained during draft. Okay, yeah. okay, number two, number two. Use both Sonics in some way that doesn't make sense, but at least isn't the sodding squareness go. I mean, you've got the two Sonics together. Can they not magnify, multiply their effect in some way? Mm, okay. All right. I mean, this is a library, you know, that is only limited by your imagination. Could you not introduce some sort of extra layer to it that just gets you out of the situation? Oh, that reminds me of something that I was thinking during this. Okay. Uh, which was, in fact, during the first viewing of this, which was, why do they never pick a book off a shelf and go, oh, I'm going to find a solution to this, you know? Yeah. What, why do they never consult a lexicon? Why do they never consult whatever, you know? Not a lexicon, yeah, encyclopedia. Why do they never go, oh, well, P.O.D me print on demand for me this one title which will help me whatever yeah they're surrounded by literally they're in a fucking library and we never get the they're not in a library library. they're in the library they're surrounded by the entirety of knowledge yeah but we never get to see them actually utilize the library. Like, the, in fact, we only get to see books used as a projectiles and b <laughs> uh, just ornaments. Yeah, this is a a very well organized library, but there are still you know perfectly quote unquote randomly positioned leather bound tomes here and there. They are just ornamental. That's what they are. Yeah. Yeah, that bugged me a little and bit. And also, you have, which you see a lot more of later in the episode, you have consoles in the library. So you could yeah. do a search on one of those consoles. I mean, okay, th- they happen to be cornered next to a console, but whatever. They find a console and they dr- they get something up on the console, they make some sort of clever leap and they use that. Yeah, you're in the source of all knowledge in the universe. Maybe ask a question. Or, you know, <laughs> yeah. look up something. <laughs> yeah, or have the courtesy units in some way help out. Yeah. You know, there's an oh, interface there. Oh, you know what, Scheisse, this is bringing you down a little bit for me. Yeah. Oh, Sorry. Matters. And my third option at the time was um, ask the Donna courtesy unit to talk to the Vashta Narada until they choose suicide. But now you like her, so <laughs> that's void. Forget that. Forget I said that. No, that's. I think that's the best one. <laughs> oh, uh, no. Sorry, wait, wait, hang on. E- e- editorializing a little bit. It, that's the best one in terms of we can't shuffle the scenes around because we need that conversation later on for you know the crescendo. I guess the act two of this episode, and we can't do the two Sonics. Sorry, I'm going through and playing devil's advocate here. Okay. We can't do the two Sonics because that's a climax. That's a that's an act three climax. Right. Okay, I buy that. I mean, it's a Ghostbusters, never cross the streams kind of climax. So, no, we're not going to do this, because then why doesn't he just get a second Sonic and solve every problem that he can't solve with one Deus Ex Machina machine, with two Deus Ex Machina machines? Dei Ex Machina. (laughs) (laughs) Well done. The, um, what was I going to say? Yeah, okay, so we can't do that. Yeah. I think the Donna unit is absolutely it's an ingenious it's a fantastic idea of yours absolutely use that mm. okay in fact right. why don't we get to see it more probably because we the over confusion factor from before we need to just see her in this nexus so that we can keep tabs on exactly where she is and we don't confuse the two and they have to explain why she's there and not there i don't know uh, mm-hmm. it could be done there are many ways we could have a, a fun finale to this Wait, not finale but a fun like a you know the the slow motion jump up and in mid-air freeze frame on a high five kind of scene in which <laughs> donna noble sees her own face on one of those units and goes yeah wait you never told me i was that wrinkly you never told me i had a mole over there or what is that that's my face yeah or just the horror she saw at the face the first time that 
She doesn't need to say anything. She could just be shocked and the doctor yeah, says, exactly. right, time to go. You Bundles know what, are into the TARDIS. You know what? Perfect. And then end on that. End on the biggest anticlimax for her ever. Oh, wait. You made up your own husband. You were super happy, but actually it was just a figment of your imagination and you're a massive narcissist and you're going to die alone. <laughs> That's not all. Also, your face has been hijacked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there is one element in this that we haven't addressed, which we probably should. Okay. Strackman Lux. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, as in, I, I get why you're reacting that way, because he completely changed his character from the first part, and I get why he was an essential part of the plot machinery. Yeah. But they didn't really give him much to do, did they? No, not at all. I mean, he's, in part one, He is just a vessel for um, River to arrive on the planets. Well, in part one, he's a filthy old lech, and Miss Evangelista is his vessel. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. Oh, sorry, I completely forgot about that. He's clearly pounding the secretary. <laughs> uh, and in part two, he's just, I think, I think survival instinct turns him into a good guy. Yeah. Like, at the end, he's just so happy to be alive and happy to see other people that he's suddenly, by default, a good guy. Yeah, and he's running around overjoyed. Look, everybody's saved. It's, yeah, it's great. Yeah, everyone's yeah. so happy. Oh, my God, I haven't lost my family fortune. This place is worth tons right now. That's probably <laughs> what he's thinking. Oh. I can start selling library cards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can reopen the canteen. Exactly. Plenty of mark up there. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Because, I mean, it's the biggest data core in the known universe. It's going to use up some, you know, electric bill. Yeah, you're right. He's got to pay for that Wait, shit. Wait, exactly. Oh, unless... <laughs> well, at this point, there's probably some sort of, you know, perpetuum mobile kind of thing in the middle that, you know, there's a collapsed star or something in the center of it. Oh, yeah, maybe. How did the Doctor get out of his handcuffs? I mean, I know that I know that you skip to the end and you yeah. don't see every last bit, but I, I did like where they... um. They dwelt on him, just silently there looking at where River had been. I liked that, you know, while everyone upstairs is really happy, you cut back down to the Doctor, and it's more of Tennant's great acting in this episode. You just see him taking it all in, and he doesn't know what to make of it, and he's confused, but he's desperately sad because he knows what's coming. There is so much you can read into that. That's such a good point. I mean, we never get to see, like, a funeral or anything, because presumably this... What happened to her wasn't, like, sorry, again, with the um, lawnmower man. Have you seen the lawnmower man? No, I've been uh, winging it to this point. <laughs> in nod the and smile, nod and smile. In the lawnmower man, there's a scene in which he goes into the internet. It's like, you know, the very, very similar to... Um, Oh, what's it called? Johnny Depp? He... Transcendent? Transcendence. Yes, you're right. I've seen that either. It's so-so. Very similar to that, except in The Lawnmower Man, he puts on, as I recall, he puts on, like, <laughs> headphones and, yeah. a, and VR goggles, and then he is uploaded into the internet, and his body just goes... <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Like, it's just, it, it's never explained. I mean, it's a shit movie. It's never explained, but somehow part of his physical presence is diminished, you yeah. know, it's just sucked up into the internet. And presumably the same thing doesn't happen here. Like, she isn't physically uploaded into the Nexus. She is intellectually uploaded. She is, you know, her physical pre being is still going to be there. And yeah. we never get to see him physically bid farewell. So he's he's looking at that a burnt-out corpse on her death row, essentially. No, I mean, we get to see the empty chair. Are we? Oh, right. I think we do get to see the empty chair. Yeah, I think Meaning... Right. She's been disposed of. Oh, well, that's a, that's a grim way of viewing it. But I mean, at some point, he will have been handcuffed right next to her. Yeah. After she had been uploaded. Yeah, and Unless she was or whatever happened. Yeah. Or, oh, okay, wait. I guess that's another possibility. Maybe through wibbly-wobbly energy, she was evaporated. She turned oh, into yeah. uh, Kylie Minogue's part. Could be. Yeah. But anyway, I, I did sorry, like the tangent. look we got at him in that I thought it was, you know, all the poignant moments in this yeah. were done very well. Yeah, I agree. Okay, shall we jump into ratings? Just one just one <laughs> question I have for you, just one question. <laughs> okay. What did you think of Funny River's Olive. sort of talking over the end? Did you like it? Wait, remind me. As when in she's River like, stops, oh, uh, Yes, uh, yes, the Doctor, if he ever stopped running, all the worlds would turn dark. And she, the story she's telling to her kids, it transpires. Oh, yeah. I mean, Sorry, I'm eating an olive. <laughs> I'm projecting here, but did you think it was great, or did you think it was naff? Or do you have an independent viewpoint? Once again, goddamn Olive, I'm sorry. Bloody martinis. Um, I thought I thought it was good. Yay! I thought it was very good because in my mind, those children are basically just extensions of herself, and this is her daydreaming about him. 
Okay. Because, I mean, whom is she telling otherwise? She's not telling real children. Those children will never grow up, right? Yeah, that's right. So she's telling herself that. Yeah, and, and they, they immediately age to the exact same age Donna's children were. They are the same children. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's she has a fake life now forever, and the, thing, the only difference is that she's aware of it, which actually makes it hell. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> enough of that. Okay. Well, <laughs> ratings? <laughs> ratings! <laughs> And now it is time to rate this. Did we laugh or hate this? Bing bong, bing bong, hey, la 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 la. Ratings. Do you want to go first? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go for it. Here I go. This is a tough one to score. It is wildly uneven. I think it's definitely the weaker of the two. And interesting. We have, we have found a lot more to pick at. Oh, that's so interesting. Okay. In this episode. Um, but while it starts off plunging into an abyss, and the Doctor literally plunges into an abyss halfway yeah. through, Moffat's writing is good enough. It does recover somewhat by the end, but it's, it's less original. The first one was original in a really unbridled way, whereas this one is more recognisably Moffaty for me. Interesting. I think Tate does very well. Yeah. Tennant's great. Alex Kingston by the end. Ah, oh, me gusta. My jaw hit the floor with that <laughs> knockout blow. Me gusta. I, I am giving it a 3.8. Holy smokes. And remember 4.2 was the maximum after the two. Oh, just wow. Heartbreak. Oh, that is way lower than I'm going. Okay. Interesting. Okay, so I, I had to double check. I gave part one a 4.7. I'm absolutely subtracting a few points for reasons already discussed over the past hour and a half. But I also feel like the whole Nexus B-plot, which really wasn't touched upon in episode one, lends an entirely new dimension to this story. And I think that is super interesting. I mean, it's, there's a reason why most of my notes for, in fact, for this whole double feature concerned the Nexus in part two. Like, that's what I find incredibly interesting. And I think it was quite well crafted. So that bumps it up. What bumps it down is the library isn't used at all. So let's say we start at the same 4.7. It bumps it up to 4.8 or whatever, maybe even a 4.9 because the Nexus has been added to that. Okay. The library isn't used at all. Ah, oh, shit, 4.6. But Tate is surprisingly good. And I, I hate her surprisingly little. 4.7 again River Song is amazing we get the snapping of the fingers which cancels itself out because he has to do it twice I, oh yeah and we also get the terrible denied love between Lee and the double D's uh, uh, I'm gonna have to say <laughs> 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 Sorry, Donna, I mean, I'm giving this another 4.7. Okay. For for different reasons than I gave part one a 4.7, but still a 4.7. Right. It's well, fucking amazing. Is. <laughs> oh, it's, I love this. It's I, definitely still way up there for me. I haven't yeah. given many episodes over a 3.8. Now as a double feature, how do you compare this to, I'm sorry, I'm going to say it again, Blink. Oh, as a double feature. As a double feature. This is a double feature compared with the singularity that is Blink. No, I would go with Blink. Really? I mean, Somehow well, I feel like this might be better. Well, I would go with the first episode of this one, but then you have to follow up with the second one. Interesting, because the first one, the first episode of this one is just zombies to me. It has the echo, that's the the cool thing, right? Yeah. But surely, the rest is just zombies. the introduction of River is the cool thing. Sure, but here you get the exodus of River, and you get the fortification of her role in his life. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Splendido. We have a listener mini. Really? Who's it from? Tracy from America. <laughs> Okie dokie, Tracy goes, Tracy here, I know it's just a string of random thoughts, but it's been a stressful week. Now shut up and take my mini. River asks, who's got a chicken leg? Another Dave is super reluctant. I get the distinct feeling he's thinking, yeah, I'm the black guy and I have the fried chicken. Make a joke already. River tells the doc his name. Holy freaking epic. After cautioning all of them multiple times to not cross shadows, ten minutes in, Doc's shadow clearly crosses several of them after he's paced in a neat circle around them. That's probably a good point, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I reached the books equals paper equals trees way before the doctor. Guess it's a stressful week for him as well. <laughs> Again, Tate does a really spectacular job job here as the mum in psychological thriller slowly losing her mind. There's some nice design elements with the saved slash reincarnated in black and the permanent Matrix members in white speaking to themes of death and heaven. Oh, I hadn't thought about that. I did not right. put that together at all. Okay, see I thought that River was wearing white because she was the Doctor's wife and that would reflect forward. Oh, interesting. But this makes much more sense. <laughs> yeah, you're right. There's something angelic about that towards the end. Yeah. But does that mean that everyone who wears black is just there in hell. Hell is other people. They're all together and it's just, ugh. 
Oh, no. Wow. You're stuck here now, guys. All right, great. Uh, <laughs> Tracy goes on. Doc is so very mischievous, suggesting they read the diary together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. The ending speech River gives is such a nice closing for her character, even though she will see the Doctor one more time before she finally fades. Ooh. Oh, so there is another one. I didn't know this. Okay, fantastic. She goes on, such a tragic ending for Donna and that guy she left in Unimatrix (laughs) Unimatrix Zero. Uh, Nice, that's another Star Trek reference. Uh, I got distracted by River's beginning slash ending and it kind of loses its sting. It's not the last time Donna is hurt at the expense of the plot. Tracy's rating is, well done all round. Gossamer. (laughs) Awesome. Thank you so much for sending that in, Tracy. Uh, some super good points there. Ladies and gentlemen of Podcast Land, you can follow Tracy on the tweets. Uh, she is at Nyekatnyatnuf. That's Fountain, Fountain Tracy backwards. <laughs> This has been a fantastic episode. I, I feel like we've reached the end of it now. Can people high five you online, Drew? They can. I mean, if they want. If you don't want, I'd rather you didn't. But if you do, I'm at Drew back when. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you can high five me online as well. I am at Ponkin. You know how to spell that. This has been a fantastic review. I've had a great time. Holy smokes, we have sat here about twice as long as we normally sit around. This has been a really good episode to dissect. Yeah, we should do another new one of these soon. What's next? <laughs> Next up, uh, we we actually will do a classic Who review. It will be The Ambassadors of Death, after which we will have another new Who review, namely Midnight. <laughs> and at some point in the possibly not too distant future, but possibly distant future, <laughs> we will have an audio Who review, and it will be The, the Cannibalists. cannibalists. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for listening. Catch you in the next one. Be rad and Excellent to each other. Rock on and shit ciao. Bye. <laughs> oh shit. Dude. Holy smokes. That was fucking excellent. It was. <laughs> <laughs> Kablamo. Did you enjoy the show? Then please do what the cosmos compels you to and spread the gospel of who back when. Tell your friends. Don't have any friends? No problemo. Tell some strangers. Like us on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash who back when. All in one word. Are you on Google Plus? But find us on Google Plus. That's Plus Who Back When. And when you do, tell us why you're on Google Plus. Who Back When just got its very own Twitter account. No lie. So give us a follow. You guessed it. That's at Who Back When. All in one word. Check us out on SoundCloud. Vote us up on Reddit. Listen to us on Stitcher. And head on over to our website, whobackwhen.com, where you can leave a comment, submit a review of your own, and peruse of visual index of aliens, monsters, and more, which increases in Kablamos with every episode. And lastly, give us a rating and review on iTunes. Not only would it make us super chuffed, and it really, really would, but as thanks, we will transmigrate your iTunes nom de plume into the credit list of trailers for fake Doctor Who audiobooks produced by Who Back When. Have a poke around our bonus episodes to make more sense of that. That's it. Rock on and be rad and excellent to each other. Catch your earballs in our next classic Who review, new Who review, or <laughs> still funny audio Who review. Cha ciao. Who back when?